my name is Jan Maxey. I am the Director of Public Programs here at the Holocaust Museum LA. This is our conversation series, Building Bridges. We do this every couple of months. We just started back in person, so this is thrilling for us to have you all here. We, of course, are an institution guided by the story of the Holocaust, very much centered on the story of survivors. We are the oldest uh, survivor-founded Holocaust museum in the country, and so survivors and their stories of hope and survival and perseverance are what kind of guide us. Do I have any survivors with us tonight in the audience? No, but I'm sure we do at home. So we all observe. Wonderful. treasure all our survivors in this community. Um, also, I want to acknowledge our board members because, of course, we can't do what we do, and I know that we have a few board members here tonight. Can you stand or raise your hand so we can just see? There we go. Okay, well, we have a wonderful program with incredible guests, so but without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful CEO and President, Beth Keene. Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you to everyone here and to everyone who's watching online for joining us this evening. Um, it's really thrilling for us to see such a great turnout after doing Building Bridges virtually for the last two and a half years. Also, I wanted to point out there are a lot of, there are some seats up front if people in the back want to move up. I think it's important to point out that our Building Bridges series was actually created in 2020 in response to the murder of George Floyd and the ensuing protests that called attention to systematic, systemic racism across the country. We saw a need for dialogue between seemingly disparate and sometimes fractured communities to seek better understanding. Holocaust Museum LA is proud to continue convening leaders from diverse communities for important town hall conversations about working toward common social justice goals like the one we have planned for tonight. For our newcomers in the audience, our museum's mission is grounded in teaching students and visitors the critical lessons of the Holocaust and its continued social relevance, empowering them to speak out and stand up against hatred and bigotry in all its insidious forms. We strive to build a culture rooted in kindness empathy, and treating people with respect. The museum offers customized tours, artifact-rich and high-tech exhibits, creative educational programs, and intergenerational conversations with Holocaust survivors. Our student programs are truly making an impact. Students come in as bystanders and leave our museum as upstanders. Since opening our permanent home in Pan Pacific Park in 2010, we have welcomed more than 500,000 visitors to date, but space is at capacity, especially during school hours and certainly for public programs like tonight's. For those of you who are here, you can see why we need to do this project. To meet the need and demand for Holocaust expansion plan to double the museum's footprint in the park without sacrificing any green space, we will break ground in April on the new Jonah Goldrich campus that will allow us to keep survivor voices alive, amplify our reach and impact, and increase our visibility. In honor of Martin Luther King Jr. Day this coming Monday, this evening's Building Bridges program will explore the close allyship of black and Jewish communities. Black and Jewish communities in the United States have a long history of partnership. And the city of Los Angeles has its own unique history of biracial political cooperation. But even in the pursuit of common goals, no alliance is without its challenges. We are pleased to welcome community leaders for a productive discussion on how our communities can continue to foster strong ties, work together to fight hate and injustice and build a more humane world. Our panelists, okay, so I'm gonna do the bios for our panelists now, so as I say your names, please walk up. Okay, activist, author, and actress, Donzele Abernathy is the daughter of civil rights
Pastor William Smart is president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of Southern California and is an experienced civil rights leader. Pastor Smart. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, oh, great. Don Delay and Rabbi Dresner. Here they are. Institute for the Study of the Jewish Role in American Life. It is now pl my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's program, museum board member, Dan Schnur. Dan, Dan is a professor at USC Annenberg School of Communications, UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies, and Pepperdine called Dan Schnur Political Report for the LA World Affairs Council Town Hall. As one of California's leading political strategists, Dan has worked on four presidential and three gubernatorial campaigns. He served as the National Director of Communications for the 2000 presidential campaign of US Senator John McCain and was the chief media spokesperson for California Governor Pete Wilson. Dan. and for serving as our moderator today. And Beth, thank you so much. I'd like all of you, before we get started, to take a moment to thank uh, the museum's executive director, Beth Keen, and the entire amazing team they have here for all the tireless work they do day
Thank you very much, Pastor Smart. I think it's a perfect way to begin this conversation. As a wise man once said, we're strongest in the broken places. And what I hear the pastor say is that it is our struggles that gives us the strength. Conversation is a I can't think of a better way to begin the conversation. Thank you very much, sir. I want to bring Avi Dresner into the conversation. Because I have to admit, while I've read quite a bit over the years about Avi's legendary father, I didn't know much about Avi until he was suggested as a panelist for this program. And when I read about him and I learned about the work that he's done, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, what an ideal person to bring into our conversation. And when, and I'll often admit, we do a, a prep session where we talk these things through, not to rehearse, but just to get a sense of what everyone else is thinking about the primary types. I've made a point that I have to admit I had not thought about at all. We've talked a little bit already about the history of the relationship between our communities. But like many of you, when I think about that relationship, I think about King and Heschel. I think about Abernathy, I think about the Freedom Riders. And what Ivy reminded me is that this relationship goes back much, much further than the civil rights movement of the mid 20th century. And Ivy, I'm wondering if you can provide that same kind of reminder to our audience as you did for me, because I think it sets such an important perspective for the rest of the discussion we're going to have going forward. This didn't just start in the 1950s and 60s, did it? No, it certainly didn't. And again, I want to join Pastor Smart in thanking the Holocaust Museum and I want to especially thank this lady to my right, Don Zoy Abernathy, who is the one who recommended me for this. <laughs> You'll forgive us for being a little late. We were actually filming. I was interviewing Don Zoy for a documentary I'm making about my dad, and I was filming her in the green room uh, furiously. She was reading all the letters that my uh, that her father sent my father. Uh, and we could hear the beautiful singing in the background while she was reading these letters, and it was spot on perfect. Although your applause screwed up our shots. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the last applause you get. Exactly. <laughs> There's a reason you haven't heard of me. Um, so, the prehistory the of this is something that personally fascinates me because most people, well, the Great Migration occurs at the end of the 19th century uh, and continues into the beginning of the 20th century where all of these African Americans are moving up from the South to the North, millions. Uh, at the same time, East European Jewry is immigrating to America and in the millions. And they wind up in the same cities and they wind up living in close proximity because unlike other white groups, the Jews didn't have a problem living with blacks. Other white groups wanted to get away from them. The Jews didn't have that hang. And I think that's very important. And so I think we often say familiarity breeds contempt, but familiarity also breeds fellowship. And so I think that it began with the great, not just me, this is not my opinion, this is scholars in the field. Um, it really begins with that proximity in the late 1890s, early 1900s, not coincidentally. That is exactly the era when all the organizations that became the organizations in the civil rights movement were founded, and Jewish organizations that participated. You can trace almost every single organization you can think of. The SCLC was a bit later, uh, but the NAACP was founded in 1909. The ADL was founded, I think, 1913. Uh, all of these organizations, they're founded at roughly the same time uh, and for similar reasons. They were really originally founded as mutual aid societies for African Americans and for Jews. And what they found was that they had common cause. And you had prominent Jewish Americans who were amongst the founders of the NAACP. People don't realize that for the roughly 110 year existence of the NAACP, 40 some odd years of that time, it had a Jewish president. The highest honor that an African American can achieve from the NAACP is known as the Spingarn Medal. Two brothers, Joel and Ethan Spingarn, who between them were either chairman of the board or president of the NAACP for 40 some odd years. People don't know this history. 
uh, Julius Rosenwald and the Rosenwald School. Over roughly 5,000 schools throughout the South, Julius Rosenwald is a Jewish president of Sears Robot. He partners up with Booker T. Washington, and they open these schools all across the South. Many of the leaders of the civil rights movement were educated. Many of the activists in the civil rights movement grew up as a result of these schools. And so this, the civil rights movement didn't just spring up ex nihilo. It really began with this prehistory that few people know about. And my job's probably up. <laughs> <laughs> Not even close. We're going to be coming back to you over and over. There's one more point I want to make that, that the NAACP, this was not a one way relationship where the Jews were the benefactors and African Americans were the clients. This went both ways. There's often this paternalistic view that we're helping you out. Um, so there's some truth to that, unfortunately, and we can talk about that hopefully in our subsequent conversation. The NAACP lobbied several uh, nations, Haiti, Liberia, and I believe the Philippines, to get them to support in the United Nations the foundation of the state of Israel. So this got both ways, and I think that's an important point to make. Thank you. Um, I want to turn now to Donjale Abernathy, who I've known of for quite some time, but had the privilege to meet, albeit by Zoom, for the first time just a few days ago. And for those of you who have not seen her on stage or on screen, or have not read her work in print, or have not had the chance to meet her, I promise you, you're in for a treat here tonight, because this is a really extraordinary woman. Um, by the way, that's a very cathartic feeling, by the way, the applause thing, so if you want to try that, you should feel free to. Um, so many of us, we've read about these struggles, we've learned about them, we've watched them. At Donzele, you and of course your family, you've lived them. And I'm wondering if you could tell, talk to those of us who've learned how your own experience and, and how the work of your father shapes your own thinking on the importance of this relationship of this partnership. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much. I have to do this. It's, it, I'm so honored and um, blessed that Beth King's husband, John King, <laughs> whom I met so many years ago, um, asked me to come and to participate and be a part of this discussion that I was hoping we could have done in 2022 because I think that it's uh, necessary. And, and thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this distinguished panel. I'm here because I am the daughter of. Um, not that I've done so many great things in my life, I attempt to live up to what my father and Uncle Madun did. And they used to say, to whom much is given, much is expected. And so we were expected to do our part. And that began when we attended, um, well, you know, I can go back further. When I was in vitro in my mother's stomach in January 10th, January 10th of 1957, the Ku Klux Klan bombed our home. So I was born months later and I just trembled, just like this. And I trembled for six months. So I was carrying the trauma in my body that my mother had experienced. Mm. Um, they used to call every morning and every evening and say that they were gonna kill them. They'd call them the N-word and that they were gonna bomb our, um, you know, bomb our home. They made good on that promise. Um, so that was my introduction. And I was a witness to these things, to these great men and great women and the sacrifices that they were making. And so I learned um, ultimately uh, after attending the March on Washington and seeing all of these events, I learned that I needed to do my part and that's when I started marching and participating in the Selma's Montgomery March. Um, so we marched uh, two days and 16 miles and they gave us a salt tablet and I learned you couldn't go to the bathroom and that you needed to do your part. And it was my responsibility. And, um, and so subsequently, I'm trying to do that even today because 
I have to. And because there's so many people who won't rise up and say anything or do anything. And we got to this place because we have it done, because people have been silent. And the question is why? Are you afraid or are you in denial? And, and those of us who are in this room this evening, obviously you all want to do something and we have to do something because today anti-Semitism has risen and is continuing to rise its ugly, hateful head. Racial oppression against black people has skyrocketed. There's Asian hatred and there's hatred of Latino people and immigrants. And I will never forget being somewhere and two Latino people were speaking Spanish to each other and one white woman says, speak English, speak English. This is the United States of America. Uh, so there's an intolerance that has to be stopped. Mm -hmm. And in order for it to stop, we need to discuss. We need to have these conversations like we're having here. But we're preaching to the choir here. But the important thing is to figure out how we can bridge that gap and go out to the nation as a whole. And this conversation that we're literally having is being con considered by people of the extreme right as critical race theory. And I'm simply telling you all our history. And a people who do not know their past are destined to repeat it. And it is about to be repeated. And they can, we cannot allow white supremacists and white supremacy to separate black people and Latino people and, and black people and Jewish people and black people and Asian people. We have all been at the bottom of the barrel together. And we need to find that common ground and together united we can rise up. But if they, we allow them to use that theory of uh, divide and conquer, mm -hmm. they will conquer. Mm -hmm. And we can't allow hatred to conquer. And a, a few minutes ago, I was just trying to quote this, but this is what Uncle Martin used to say. You got to love this white man because God loves him. He said, I can't like Bull Connor, the police chief who turned the water hoses and the dogs on people, but when you rise to love on that level, you love those you don't like. You love those whose ways don't move you. You love every man because God loves them. And that's what we have to do. I can't necessarily like those extremists within the Republican Party who couldn't even find a chairman, vote for a chairman. <laughs> but I have to love them. I have to show compassion, and I have to figure out how to reach across that aisle and figure out how we can live together as a people. And if we don't learn to live together, we will all perish together as fools. And one other thing I want to say, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. I go and talk to the senior citizens over here at the Sunrise Assisted Living Facility here in Beverly Hills. And there's this wonderful lady named Mrs. Ann Spicer, and she showed me the numbers on her arm, uh, the number of which was how her identification at uh, the synagogue, I mean, at the, uh, at, 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 in Auschwitz, and, and, but she was in Ravensbrück, or Ravensbrück, this concentration camp, where my father insisted that we go and experience and go into the crematorium and do all this. But the thing of it is, is Mrs. Spicer says to me, to my black face, Teach our young people. Tell them our history. Tell them what happened to black people. Tell them what happened to Jewish people. She's almost 100 years of age. Woo! And it shed chills down my spine and humbled me with this older Jewish woman. She was saying, Not even, my people don't even know our history. So please tell our history. So that's how we're going to solve this. Just like you all have that Passover supper and you have the oldest member of the family and the youngest member of the family sit down and you read that Haggadah, you're going to have to do that in your community as well. And you're going to have to do it with our black children. And this is the thing that I always say to the black community when I speak to a room full of black people. We need to be like the Jews. <laughs> we need to teach our children the same way and teach that struggle. We're in this together. And, and Avi didn't get a chance to say about Moses' black wife. But Moses' wife was an Ethiopian woman in the Bible. I brought the Bible today, that King James Bible. And it says that, uh, yes, she was an Ethiopian girl. And she was black like me, okay? 
Okay. And so, yes, there will be some white people who have trouble with it. Tell them to get over it. Get over because it. that love has been here is long, longer than this we've been we've been having in this land since Moses' time. So we got to figure out how we're gonna live together and love each other and, and be together. And I live in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood. Do I not, Beth? That's my neighbor. <laughs> okay? And our neighborhood is Orthodox and Hasidic. And we get along just fine. <laughs> I am certainly hoping, Donald Avenatt, that that is not all you have to say. You laid out a path for us, and I want to come back to you in just a minute or two to talk about the best strategies for us to walk that path. But what I want to do first is I want to bring Rabbi Sharon Browse in this conversation. And what I will tell all of you is that all five of our panelists are as you might imagine, incredibly busy people because they're an extraordinary demand for their time and their leadership. But I will tell you, getting Rabbi Sharon Brown Rabbi Sharon Brown's schedule is no mean feat at all. <laughs> and I've had the privilege in the past of being on, 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 on panels and programs with her in the past. And what I will tell you is, is like Pastor Smart, she reminds us that a religious leader is also a spiritual leader is also a community leader, is also an agent of change. And I think when someone like Sharon Bowes takes on that mantle of leadership, not just in the, in the congregation, but in the community, that's where real change happens. And so in just a moment, I want to pivot this conversation to the future. But Sharon, I'm wondering if you can also help us take a look back and tell us what lessons you draw from these past histories when you take on this fight and these challenges every day. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really honored uh, to be here with all of you tonight, and I'm so glad that my friend invited me to join us, uh, and, and thank you for, for prioritizing this conversation. Um, so I want to say a couple things. First of all, we tend to talk about the Jewish and Black communities as if they're separate communities, but they're really not. In fact, in America, um, about 12 to 20 percent of American Jews are people of color. Many of them are black Jews. Some of them might be in the room tonight, so we see you. And I just want to begin by acknowledging that, that there is a, there's a beautiful and powerful um, overlap in our identities, some, some people actually holding both identities themselves. And I resonate very much to what you're saying, that part of the reason that there's such a, a, a connection between the black and Jewish communities is because of our shared history of oppression. And Don's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to hear you preach all night. Um, when you talk about the trauma that in utero that you experienced and your hands shaking, I, I think part of what we're coming to terms with in our time is the way that trauma lives in the body and is passed down from generation to generation. And I think that you are not, you're clearly not alone in having experience. You have a particular story. Um, and given that your family was really on the forefront of the civil rights movement, um, I, I think as a Jew growing up, I, I experienced Holocaust trauma, uh, set, even though it was generations before I was born, but in, in, the, in the late 1970s, I remember that I used to say Shema every night before stepping into the shower. Because somewhere in my, child, sub, my childhood subconscious, I understood that Jews said Shema before going into the shower in case they died in the shower. You understand what I'm saying? So this is about trauma, the intergenerational trauma. And so part of what unites us is, is when, when racial terror and when, 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 racist, when, when racism and anti-Semitism and human cruelty is embedded in the system so much so that children grow up with the trauma already in them. We're also united because we share a liberation narrative. And part of what made Abraham Joshua Heschel feel so, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel feel connected to Dr. Martin Luther King and to, and to, um, to, Reverend Mark, to Ralph Abernathy and to others, and part of what I'm sure, Avi, your father was drawn to in this movement, and, and Rabbi Joachim Prince and other rabbis who came to stand at the forefront of this movement, was that the, the story of the exodus from Egypt was a central narrative of the civil rights movement and is central to our self-understanding as Jews too. It, it is the story that comprises four of the five books of the Torah. 
It is the very beating heart of our calendar year. It's the way that Jews have understood ourselves in the course of history, that we were a people who were enslaved to a tyrant in Egypt, a tyrant who was afraid, he feared that this minority community would rise up and oppress his own people. And so he ruthlessly tried to suppress this population. The population only grew in strength of spirit and body under that oppression and ultimately was able to walk um, with the partnership of God and with incredible faith to the promised land. And that's a story that when Abraham Joshua Heschel came to the United States, most of his family having perished in, in the Shoah and the Holocaust in Europe, when he heard that the civil rights movement was a black church movement, that it was driven by faith, and that it was driven by a core narrative, the narrative of the possibility of the Exodus, he thought, these two are my people. And he understood from that narrative, as I do and as we do, that liberation cannot be had by one people unless liberation is had by all of us. And that we are aligned ourselves with each other's struggles because we get that our liberation is tied up in one another. That our struggles are connected to each other, that our liberation is connected to each other. And that the great tragedy uh, of the Exodus from Egypt is that Pharaoh himself could have been a part of that liberation too but instead chose to fight to the end, and therefore he and his chariots drowned in the sea. And I, we're gonna talk a little bit about the future and about where America is today, but I wanna invite us to hold this image that's been so much at the heart of this relationship. What, what is the choice that's being made by the people who currently hold the power in America? And what would it mean if instead of fighting what they call critical race theory, if instead of fighting, a true multiracial democracy instead said, I want to be part of that liberation struggle because there's room enough for all of us in this place. What mm -hmm. then would that America actually look like? So I feel that the, the it's not it's not only a, a partnership in oppression, a partnership in victimization, but a partnership in vision. We believe together in a different kind of reality and different kinds of future. And, and we, we forget that at our own peril. When our communities allow the wedge to be placed between us, neither of us is going to be able to achieve our ultimate dream of a redeemed society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, when we first began the Building Bridges program uh, back in, in June of 2020, uh, we did so for the first year uh, with a series of regular partners. And we partnered every month with the organization HOPE, Hispanics Organized for Political Equality, the organization CAUSE, Center for Asians United for Self-Empowerment, uh, the Jewish Center for Justice, and the Los Angeles Urban League, uh, whose leader, Michael Lawson, has been with us, as Beth mentioned, throughout our entire history of this program, where I've learned, as we've talked over the last two and a half years, as we've talked about George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, as we've talked about the incredible, increasingly difficult and divisive debate taking place in this country over immigration, as we talked about the hatred that our Asian Pacific friends faced in the early stages of COVID, as we talked about the rising levels of anti-Semitism that our community has faced in recent years, and even more recently as we talked about the recent controversy at City Hall when our communities were pulled, were, when our communities were pulled apart. I've learned as a moderator in these programs that whenever I get into trouble, and whenever I don't know where to go next to the conversation, I can turn to my friend Michael Lawson, <laughs> and he's gonna find a way to rescue the conversation. And he does it, not just with wisdom, and not just with humor and with grace, but with an extraordinary sense of perspective and history. And over the next several days, we're going to hear the phrase, the moral arc of the universe, we're going to hear that phrase many times over the next several days. But when Michael talks about history, he talks about it in a way that helps us make sense of the present too. And so as we transition this conversation from what we've experienced and learned from the past to what we hope to achieve in the future, I can't think of anyone better to help us make that transition then Michael, so Michael, I'm going to ask you, how would you compare these past challenges that our fellow panelists have talked about? How would you compare these past challenges and difficulties and obstacles to the current day situation 
that we now face. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, let me first say, I am not worthy of this panel. <laughs> um, these are people who have just been in the fight from day one. Uh, I am the I am part of the result of what they have done. And part of that requires us to do more for the people that are coming behind us. So a part of the answer to your question is where where are we now and, and where are we in comparison to where we were? Um, the short answer is we are better off than where we were before, but the longer answer is that there is so much work that needs to be done. Part of the reason why we're having this conversation, and part of the reason why we are raising up and, and celebrating the history of History is the wrong term. The existence of this museum. Because in the African American community in the United States, we were late in creating our own museum. There is a book that um, I read called The Grace of Silence, and it's written by uh, Michelle Norris, uh, who was a reporter. And the stories that she tells talks about how the generations that came before us found the issues and, and trials and tribulations that they went through were so painful that they didn't tell them. Uh, she's an investigative reporter. She, in one of the stories, she talks about how, uh, as far as, it, it, as long as she can remember, her father had this limp, and she didn't know why he had the limp. When she asked about it, she didn't get an answer. After he passed away, she finally decided to go use her, her skills as, as, a, as a reporter to find out what happened. And what she found out was that when he was 19, he was shot by a police officer. Almost every African-American family in this country has a story like that. I keep the family tree for my family. Uh, my mother's family, there were 12 kids in her family. Um, but, and, and I found that out uh, later on, but, but my mother grew up telling me that there were 11. Nine boys and two girls. But I had this one uncle who whenever, he, if he was in the room, my mother said that, she said there were nine boys and two girls, and he would say, no, Ruth, there were 10 boys. And my mother would get quiet. And then she'd continue on with her story. She ignored it completely. Um, I went on Ancestry.com, did the research, and found out it, it was a child that died 18 months after he was born. I do not know what created such a horror for our entire family that she could not even talk about. And this is just a small issue. But that's the trauma that our family went through. When you, when, when we talk about the giants that are sitting on this panel and the work that they have done, and the issues that they have had to deal with and the, 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 the trauma that they have had to fight back and stand up for all of us. It is amazing and we 
give them the, the not just the support, but the honor of doing what they have done. It is clearly up to us to pick up the baton and take it forward and recognize that the fight that we are fighting now is so much easier than the fight that they had. I spend a lot of time working with, in, in the urban league, we work with people who are trying to become entrepreneurs, we work with kids who are in school, and we, we, we talk about these issues. And the phrase that comes up all too often is, things have never been this hard. And I have to remind them as soon as they say that. If you believe that things have never been this hard, you do not understand your history. What my father went through, what his father went through, what his father's father went through is just what we are going through now pales in comparison. But it's not the pale in comparison statement that really gets me up in the morning. It's the fact that I know that I am here because of their sacrifices. The people that are on this panel have sacrificed so much more than I have. But one of the things that we are doing in this generation is reaching back. And, and, and pulling people forward and saying, you can do this. We had a black president for eight years that people thought was never going to happen. Next Tuesday, I am flying to Maryland to witness the inauguration of an African-American governor of Maryland. And these things are happening because of the coalition that you see it on this stage. Mm -hmm. We could not have done this by ourselves. We, and, and, but it is this arm in arm coalition that frightens the right wing. Mm -hmm. They are scared to death. That is why they are, when people say it hasn't been this bad, they are doing this because they are frightened. And they are frightened because our, we are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And as long as we lock arms and continue to move in the direction that we have, that, that our parents and, and, and their parents and their grandparents, the people that I'm sitting between, I, again, I am humbled. But more than humble, I am excited. Because we're, we are moving in the right direction, we're working together, and it is not gonna happen overnight. But I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas. There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference, and we're moving in the right direction with a lot of stuff, a lot of work that has to be done. We are taking cues from our Jewish brothers and sisters. We are remembering our history. We are not allowing that history to be squashed. And we will continue to move on. Thank you. I think that most of our camera on how profoundly wrong you were with your very first statement. When you said that you were not worthy of this panel. But we agree with everything else that you said, so thank you very, very much. Finally, Abernathy, I want to come back to you because you made such an important point earlier, several, but one in particular I want to focus in on. And I'm going to paraphrase if I may, but what I heard you say is we can't simply just preach to the choir. Or in the case of Pastor Smart and Rabbi Rouse, preach to the preachers. <laughs> um, and what you talked about is the importance of having a national conversation. 
And rather than simply talking with people who already agree with us, the much more uncomfortable but necessary step of reaching out beyond that first concentric circle. Can you talk a little bit more about how that gets done and how we should move forward toward that broader and more ambitious goal? Well, that goal is a necessary goal. And I know that Michael is very hopeful and I am with you. However, I am reminded of that period in Reconstruction when W.E.B. Du Bois was in a great debate about how we were gonna go forward and how we we're gonna stop. And Booker T. Washington was trying to make a concession. And ultimately, Reconstruction came to an end, segregation was instituted, and we moved backwards in history. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that to happen in my lifetime. I know that my parents paid too much a price. Mm -hmm. Too many people died. So what do we do? How do we do it? Right now, and I believe in about 35 states across the union, they're trying to stop what is considered, uh, what they consider to be critical race theory, but they're also stopping the teaching of black history. And also, if, let's say, we are in Texas, and you want to teach about the Holocaust, you're going to have to also teach the ideology um, that created that. So that's meaning giving justification to Adolf Hitler and what he did and, and all of that, uh, you know, that right. Uh, so we need to have this, like I said, a bigger conversation. In order to have that bigger conversation, we need to reach out to, I believe, to school boards across America, and we need to pull celebrities into this conversation and have them go forward. Just like that young man, this young black man who shall, or there are three of them that who shall be nameless, who decided to think and condemn Jewish people. I don't need to say their names, you know who they are, but condemned Jewish people. And that's all based upon ignorance. So then we need to counteract that and have celebrities speak out and if necessary, do what we used to do which our young people did when George Floyd was killed, was take to the streets in March, arm in arm, like my dad and Rabbi uh, Dresner and Rabbi Abraham Heschel and Rabbi Eisendroth and march in protest to the rise of racial hatred and anti-Semitism and intolerance. But we have to take it to a national level. We really and truly, and we have to take it also on another level to an international <coughs> level because, um, uh, the Sanders in Florida, his hero is the president of Yugoslavia who doesn't want any diversity in his country at all. So we have to, you know, go across the, uh, the pond mm -hmm. to all of those other, other people and, and have them understand that we mean business here in the United States of America and we're not going to accept it. That's what I think. And, and um, um, on the 12th, I go to Pennsylvania. And from Pennsylvania, I go to Wisconsin, and then I come back to LA, and then I go to Dallas, I come back to LA, and then I go to Michigan. And so I go to universities across America, and I talk to young people, and I try to inspire them to let them know that they have to do this fight. And I know that it works because in 2020, uh, just before the pandemic started, I was at this Davis Adolphus College in Minnesota. And I'm in Minnesota and I'm teaching these young people what dad and Uncle Martin, what your dad got a part of and what they did and how they took to the streets. And sure enough, when George Floyd was killed, some of those same Gustavus Adolphus College students, two of them were texting me, yes, Ms. Donsley, we're out here marching. Ms. Donsley, we're doing this and no, we are nonviolent and with the police are violent. But these students were there on the forefront which then inspired students all over America. So I know that it's possible, but we've got to have these conversations and you've got to have these conversations with your kids mm -hmm. and you have to teach them their history and let them understand. And um, then they can facilitate change, but we also need to address the boards of education in all these different places. Like I'm one of the founders of the School of New Roads, which is here in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And every single year I used to go and Martin Luther King Day and sit on the floor with the elementary school students, with the middle school students and with the high school students 
and I would go every single year. But I did not realize until I'm watching the presidential inauguration and I see Amanda Gorman stand up and do her thing. And she's one of those little girls. She and her twin sister, Gabrielle, and I realized, oh yeah, it makes a difference because it made a difference in who she is and what she has become in the symbol. And that it's possible. It's possible. And if we don't do it, we'll go back. And I want you to know I'm not going back. I knew too many people who gave their lives and died in the struggle for our freedom. I'm not going back. I was born under segregation in the segregated hospital. I know what segregation was like in the South. I'm not going back. So that's on each of us to do something. And yes, we need to march. We need to take this thing forward. And we've got a president who will back us up. I have marched with our president. Or faith in politics with Martin Luther King III. We were right behind him with this uh, Secret Service guy. So I know that it's possible, but do we have the courage to do it? So before we go on, I want to make sure that everybody heard both pieces of advice that we were just given by Don Smith. She talked about the importance of activating and mobilizing celebrity voices to bring attention to these causes. I think that's exactly right. But she also talked about students at Gustavus Adolphus College in rural Minnesota. She also talked about Amanda Gorman, who I should remind you, was not a celebrity before she spoke out, but became a celebrity because she spoke out. So on one hand, if I understand you right, you're saying it's perfectly well and good and helpful for George Clooney and Oprah Winfrey and political leaders and singers and actors to be active in this. But those students, those workers, those neighbors, those parents are ultimately the strength behind the, behind the success of any movement. And I hear you, and, and your point about the celebrities I think is very well taken. But I want to make sure everyone here understood the rest of the point, which is, as they used to say, a leader without followers is to die out for a walk. <laughs> and if it's going to happen, the rest of us need to be part of that movement also. So thank you for both pieces of wisdom. We're very grateful to you. Avi, I'm going to give you a really lousy job here. Because as we've been talking, like all of you, I've been very inspired. It's been stirring to hear our leaders talk about the challenge and how we can confront it and overcome it. That said, these are difficult challenges. And we mentioned just in passing at the outset that while our communities have a long and strong and rich history of working together, it's not a seamless history. And before we can move forward together to have the kind of broader national conversation that Don Zillay talks about, we have to make sure that we can move forward together. And that hasn't always been easy because some of the stories of our history are a little bit more difficult to tell than others, aren't they? Let me be positive before I be negative. Um, <laughs> I just want to say a word about preaching to the choir, because that's come up a couple times. I think preaching to the choir is actually very important, because we need the choir to go out there and proselytize if we want to build a congregation of justice. And so we may have the microphones up here, but you have the numbers. And especially, imagine what Ralph Abernathy and Martin Luther King would have done with social media. So, if you multiply each one of us by each one of you, multiplied by everyone in your network, that's how we're going to get there. And so, I just want to say that now. In terms of the, the challenges, I think everyone up here and every one of you, we have a responsibility to call out our own. And so, Donzley didn't name names. I'll name them, right? For every Kanye, for every Kyrie, I think they're somewhat different, but let's lump them together for now. Uh, there has to be a Tyler Perry. Some of you may not have seen this. Tyler Perry, in response to that stuff, posted a picture of his mother, who was a preschool teacher at a JCC in New Orleans. 
uh, who brought him up saying that when the JCC got a bomb threat, that was no different than the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. And we, that's the antidote. That's part of the, part of the antidote. But I think we have to acknowledge that there is racism in the Jewish community and bigotry and prejudice. And there's anti-Semitism in the African-American community. There always has been, and frankly, there always will be. And that shouldn't stop us, but we do have to acknowledge it. We do have to have that conversation. That conversation is not always easy. So let me give you an example of, it's subtle, but I think it's important. And I hope that if I give you any takeaway from tonight, it will be this. As a white Jewish person, when you say to an African American, I know just how you feel because I'm part of a persecuted minority too. It's well-meaning, I've said it myself. No, we don't. And it's okay to say that. And I think it's important for African Americans to hear that. And I appreciate what Rabbi Brow said about the intersectionality. Obviously there are more African American Jews than ever, and speaking about us as us and them is part of the problem, but nevertheless, don't say that anymore, because we don't know. We have white privilege. Woo! And I think we have to acknowledge that if we want to have an honest conversation. And it's not about being woke and it's not about being politically correct. That's the reality. And not enough of us recognize that. So please don't say to your African-American friends, I know just how you feel because we don't. So I think that's part of it. And I think when it comes to anti-Semitism in the African-American community, I can't tell the African-American community who to pick as leaders. I prefer that it not be far down, right? But I think that for every one of those who are spewing hate, we need at least two who are spewing love. Because unfortunately, hate spreads faster. And so I think, but, but we do have to begin with that basic acknowledgement of those issues, and we don't have time tonight to cover that, but I'm happy to talk out and ask him about this afterwards. Well, I think acknowledging the need for the conversation, of course, Avi, is the first step toward having that necessary conversation. So it's not always pleasant, but it is necessary. So thank you for reminding us of the challenges we face as we move forward. Pastor Smart, I'm going to call on you now, because now that we've been reminded of the scope of the challenges we face, <laughs> Well, we're going to need some practical steps on how to move forward. Most of the conversation up until now has taken place at a pretty high level. But I was struck by when you told me about the Black Jewish Justice Alliance that you've established. And I'm wondering if you can talk about your experience with that effort and other practical steps that we can be taking to, over, to confront the challenges that we've been discussing tonight. Thank you. So. When I took over the Southern Christian Leadership Conference about 10, I mean, 10 years ago, I had sectional leaders, I mean, sectional meetings with different leaders. And one of them were, was with um, African-American pastors. I wanted them to be very supportive of our work. And I asked them in the meeting, I said, well, what's something we can do that can really augment our work and establish the organization on strength? And three of them, back to back, said, we need to go back to the time when we had a stronger relationship with the Jewish community. And I said, okay. And I remember when I first got here that um, came to Los Angeles, Harvey Fields and um, John Mack used to have a coalition and my bishop invited me to be in that coalition. And we used, we talked about doing things, and they had done things more <laughs> historical before I had gotten here. So I went to Jonathan um, Klein. Klein, Jonathan, my good friend Jonathan Klein, who was at Clue. And I said, I just had a meeting with black pastors, and they want to get together with the with people of the Jewish community and let's do some stuff. So Jonathan and I were close and we worked together. So we put together a meeting and it became the um, 
um, African American African American Jewish Justice Alliance, and that's where I met this young lady right here, Patsy, <laughs> who has been like my my right hand and social activist. She doesn't come to me for the spiritual. She, she lets me know. <laughs> <You're my leader. laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we share Patsy. Oh, this is my wife here. Let me say my, my right hand. This is my wife, my pastor. This is my pastor. And this is this is Anton Farney, the new chairperson of SCLC's board. So my family's right here. And so we established the organization and we have done and we found it was during a time in America, all type of issues. We could, you know, we didn't, at that time, we didn't talk about the Palestinians. We didn't talk about uh, Farrakhan. We didn't talk. We found a direction <laughs> of unity. And that is the justice wow. system in this city. That's right. And that organization has been at, you know, it has been with Black Lives Matter. It has been with all, every call for the change of justice, um, bail, wanting to change bail here, you name any area that there's a fight for justice, we're there. Why? Because we found a common core, call, core. Now let me tell you, when they call me, Patsy, Aria, Aria, Ari, Aria Cohen, and um, one other person, Jonathan Klein, and Hi, Heidi Siegel, and all of them, when they call me, I go. Because I'm, we're on that cord together. We're in that strain together. So the other day, one of our, one of the other founders, um, Q called Pastor Q, y'all know Pastor Q, he called me and said, rather than getting in the fight over what Kanye and the other whites and white supremacists have done, Let's get uh let's go to the steps of City Hall and cry with a loud, vociferous voice that we stand with our brothers and sisters and we're 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 in, in, and we're against anti-Semitism and we're against white white supremacy. And all of our other brothers and sisters came and attended. Why? Because we found a bridge. And we take that bridge and we move forward. We fight together. And we love each other. And so next Sunday, next Sunday, part of our week, of our month of activities with SCLC, we will we we have deep dug deep to get two sharp minds again to pull us together and conversation with our third annual. Um, Pesho King, it depends on where you are. Now I notice that. If, if when I'm in a black way, it's I say King Pesho. <laughs> <laughs> <Huh? laughs> it's not <how> better. <laughs> yeah, that's what it and and we we are coming together at Holman with Pastor James Lawson and Rabbi Sharon Browse. And they will have the words for us again. This is the second time we pulled them together, passing this. Pull them together. We want you there. But again, brother, we're together. We have found that score. And we just ride it together and fight and focus on it. That's right. Focus on it. Those of us who are not going to be there to listen to able to be there to listen to you on Sunday, I'd like to ask you this for now. So you've led this fight for as long as I can remember. You've pulled your congregation, members of our community together for a long time now to help marshal them and their forces in the direction of change. Similar question that I put to Pastor Smart, I'll ask to you. <clears throat> For someone who leaves tonight saying, I want to do something, I want to make a difference, what kind of practical guidance can you provide for them on what they can do to help, the, to help, to help us move forward? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, nobody ever wants to talk right after you. I just want to <laughs> um, you know, I am 
appreciate um, Avi's uh, uh, insistence that we that we speak truth to our own communities. And I want to tell you about a really powerful conversation that I was witness to at Hikar in our community um, a few years ago when Clarence Jones came to speak, um, who was one of Dr. King's uh, teachers, actually. And he's up in San Francisco up north, and he has dedicated many decades now to re-establishing the Black Jewish Alliance. And he came with Susanna Heschel, with Abraham Joshua Heschel's daughter. And Dr. Jones got up there, and he was talking so beautifully about this relationship between the Black community and the Jewish community, this historic alliance, and how we cannot fight the challenges that we face in America today unless we're able to reignite this relationship, and it's on all of us. And Susanna Heschel got up, and by the way, I'm seeing this picture of your father and, and, and um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, I think your father's in it right there, and, uh, and, and Dr. King, this beautiful, this beautiful moment from Selma to Montgomery. You were, you, were you there that day? Uh, not on that day, but I was a part of that march for two days. Okay, amazing. And, and Susanna Heschel got up there, and she's a brilliant professor up at Dartmouth, and she said, I gotta tell you, the Jews have been resting on our laurels for too long. That image of my father marching with Dr. King and, and, and with Reverend Abernathy, that image has gotten us for decades out of the fight because we've been Woo! saying, look, we were there, we were there, but where are we now? <laughs> and and I, tell you, I, I, feel, I feel it so deeply in our Jewish community. I heard from so many people who were so affronted when the Movement for Black Lives put out a statement that many in our community were uncomfortable with and, and, and found offensive and said, I'm not going to march with Black Lives Matter. They, they're anti-Semitic. Those are people who weren't in the fight in the first place. And we're living in a country and in a time when, when black people are being shot on the street almost daily. And where is our Jewish community? And, and, and when are we rising up? And so if we want to we want to talk about the history, and there is a beautiful story history here, the moment calls us into a deeper relationship now. And I understand in my own body, I understand the fear of anti-Semitism. I fear the danger for my for myself, for my children, for my congregation, for our for our people everywhere. And when our people feel under attack, when we feel vulnerable, all of us as human beings, our instinct is to retreat, to entrench, to move closer to to ourselves, to each other, and away from people who we see as the other. And what we have to do is exactly what you've done, and what you've done, and what we what we're trying to do together in this city which is when we feel most vulnerable, instead of pulling away from each other, to step toward each other. Because as vulnerable as I might feel as a Jew in America today for good reason, there are other people who are equally or more vulnerable than I am. And so this is on all of us in this moment to step. Thank God I take that image, that image is up on my, on my wall in my office. I hold that as a sacred image of, of, our, of our ancestors, right, marching together. Of those who came before us marching together, that does not let me off the hook. That's what reminds me how essential it is that I'm fighting the fight. And I appreciate your optimism about this moment. I, I, I do, and, and it's my job to be hopeful. I'm a rabbi, that's what we're called to do. But the clock is ticking. We are in the 11th hour, partially because of climate change, partially because we recognize the fragility of our democracy right now. We don't have time for the arc of the moral universe to take its time getting toward justice. So this is a fight all of us need to be in today, and this needs to be a pri our priority of ours, not just remembering the past, but actually committing to live differently in the present so that there will be a future for our children, for our grandchildren, for the next generation. That's why I like to go before her. <laughs> so, Michael Lawson, I'm going to give you our last word. And then, uh, for those of you who are able to stay for questions, of course, we're happy to have you. We're coming up just about on our one hour mark. But I think you would all agree that better to go a little bit long in order to learn to the extent that we've been able to tonight. Yeah. So for those of you, after Michael finishes, if anyone does need to leave, we understand, we respect that. The program's online, you'll be able to watch it. But for those of you who want to stay, we'll do our best to answer questions from all of you before we call it a night. But before that, Michael, I want to come back to you because you made a really important point earlier, and I feel like this is a really 
will be a very helpful way to wind up this part of the program before we go to our, our, our audience's questions. You, you talked earlier about how many people have said to you, and we've all heard, things have never been this bad. This is as bad as it's ever been. And what I've heard you say before, separately, is one of the reasons people come to that conclusion is because the haters are so much louder than they once were. In a social media era, every hater has his own television network. <laughs> and so we hear that hate a lot louder and a lot more clearly than we have in the past. But what I've heard you say, which I think is just fascinating and I think it's instructive, is that visibility and that volume, which can be so discouraging, can actually be helpful to us as we move forward. Nobody likes to hear that kind of hate. But tell us a little bit about why we can use that to our advantage when those haters can speak out so loud, loudly and so obviously. Um, th thank you for this opportunity. And again, uh, I, I am humbled by this panel. Uh, um, one of the things that I've experienced during my lifetime, and, and there was no question in, for me that I am standing on the shoulders of giants who have come before me. And I'm here because they sacrifice for me. And my job is to sacrifice for the next group. But one of the things that I have discovered in my adulthood as, as, as we move through the, these levees that we, that, we, that we have to deal with is that most people don't think for themselves. Most people will listen to what someone else will say and they will adopt that because they don't take the time to do the deep thought. And it's easy to come up with a slogan that is anti-Semitic or anti-Black and, and, and get more and more people to, to say yes, 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 but they haven't thought it through. And what I have come to understand is that our voices are louder than we know. And whenever you see something like this, whenever you hear something like this, it's amazing how powerful we are as individuals to beat back this, the, the, these horrible sayings that are out there because it is, first of all, untrue. Second of all, you look at the people beside you, behind you, in front of you. These are the people that have commanded the respect of your neighbors, of your friends, of the parents of the, your, 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 student, your, your children's school. It's amazing how much power you have that we don't use as often as we should. We are stronger than we know. We are more powerful than they are because we are standing on the truth. We are standing on the shoulders of giants that have come before us. We are here because people that we don't know sacrificed for us and it is up to us to pay that forward. And there is no way that we will be denied. It's not going to be a smooth path, but we will not just survive, not just survive, we will conquer. And there is no question about it. You see this panel here? I am, I am inspired. And I can only say thank you to all of you for what you have done, what you will continue to do. And by the way, Reverend Lawson is not a relative of mine, <laughs> but I honor him like he's the father. He has done so much, and every time I am in his presence, I am invigorated. And that is what we need to do to the people that are coming behind us. Yeah.
So thank you. So the first thing that I'd like to do before we begin to take uh, questions is to apologize in advance to all of you who would like to ask questions but are probably not going to have the opportunity tonight. Because while our team plans for just about everything, they did not plan for bring breakfast in for everybody. And I suspect we would be here until morning if everybody had the chance to weigh in with their questions. So we'll do our best to take a small number. Um, and for those who are not able to ask a question tonight, the good news is we do this regularly throughout the year. And if you don't get your question answered at this one, then just come back again when we do it in March. And we'd want to, we'll make sure that you get a chance to weigh in then. But for, for now at least, who might like to ask a question of our audience? And I'll, I'll, I'll ask the same question of our uh, audience members now that I ask my students. If before you ask our guests your question, if you can tell us your name, and then what year and what major you go. <laughs> Hi. Good evening. My name is Carrie Williams. I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. I am called as a professor. My name is Terry Williams. I want to thank each and every one of you for being here tonight. Miss um, Abernathy, I absolutely adore you. <laughs> My day is not right until I watch any day in the world. <laughs> and it comes on at 10 o'clock every morning on Smart, Smart TV. You've got to see this, and this woman's work is amazing. I was compelled to come here tonight because you're here. You look beautiful. And I wanted to say, today I was sitting in a CRT class, and the emotions of the students in that class are so raw, and they have nowhere to go to express themselves. And while the teacher is going to do her best. She can't handle what she's hearing. And she can't even ask the administration for help. She kind of swore us to secrecy about what we discussed. And my question is, why does this keep being so hush-hush? Why can the administration and the institution not understand the anxiety, the feeling that we read the history, the law, and everything else with, and we can't express or make the contributions that we came to the institution to make. My question to you is on that set, how did you keep your composure when you were faced with the constraint, the restraint, et cetera? And I love you. Mm -hmm. Oh, I might get you when you come back to LA. I have something for you to do. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I love you too. I do. Um, when you're in a difficult situation, um, um, you have to push those emotions down. And um, that's what I have to do on the TV show that I did. It, it dealt with, you know, parts of the civil rights movement. And I would go and I'd do my scene, and then we'd have a break because camera needed to set up again. And I'd go into my trailer and I would cry mm -hmm. every day because I was reliving things that, of my past or living things that my mother had gone through. And my mother became my hero through all of that. And I'll never forget, we were um, in Harper's Ferry. Um, it was the centennial celebration of the Niagara Movement. The Niagara Movement came before the NAACP. And it became the Niagara Movement because there wasn't one hotel in the United States of America that would allow W.E.B. Du Bois and all of these people to have their convention. So they had it in Niagara. And so the National Park Service hosted this event. And my, I, I wrote a play and my husband and I did it as the opening. But during one of the days of this event, there were Congress people 
that were there. But the white supremacists showed up in mass, and these uh, neo-Nazi guys in mass by the hundreds. So the SWAT people came from Washington, D.C., because it was very close, and they were there by the hundreds, too. And the audience was about double this size, and the people were afraid. The congressman and everybody was like, well, we need to cancel this, we need to cancel this, we can't do this, we can't do this. And my little baby teeny weeny mother said, oh, no, we are not. <laughs> they didn't call my house every day for me to become a shrimp. Oh, no. And she got those Congress people to board their loins <laughs> and go forward. And it was just remarkable to see my teeny weeny little mother go forward. That's right. That's right. And so I was like, you know, uh, when, you're, when you see these students, you need to tell them, yes, I share with you. I feel with you. But the administration can't do anything because of what Avi's father in that art, it was called the silent, I don't know, Uncle Martin wrote the letter and he said, the silent white people. Mm -hmm. Those are the white people that are afraid to speak up and do something. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't wait on them to deliver us. Mm -hmm. Freedom must come from the people who are oppressed and we, they are not gonna give it to us, we have to demand it. Mm. And so these students, and they are, just like this one young lady said, they're in these universities, in these schools, and they are frustrated and they are so hurt. And so you all need to form your unions and, and, and create your societies and you don't have to be secret and talk about it and go forward. Mm. He has a question. <laughs> a great lesson. It, it not only takes celebrities and students and neighbors and friends, it takes teeny weeny little mothers too. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dana Brofman. I majored in uh, U.S. history in college. I studied civil rights, the whole movement. I have three words we shall overcome for our two communities. Um, I go to the monthly meetings that Mayor Willie Bossy has in Beverly Hills. and. Um, they're um, televised. So I was at a meeting last night and they taught, they have an annual civility award for people do, who do acts of civility or kindness in the community. So last night at the meeting, I was suggesting that they do monthly or quarterly awards for people who do acts of kindness or civility to push back against these negative forces in our community. So anyone, anyone who'd like to respond, what do we think of the idea of those kind of awards to hold those heroes up as examples? Richard McGuire. That looks like you have unanimous support for your ideas. Awesome. Awesome. Other questions for our panel? Hi, my name is Elena, and actually my husband and I were in Minnesota when uh, George Floyd was murdered, and it was blocks away from my apartment. Um, but I am a pediatrician, and I'm studying um, for teenagers to be an adolescent medicine doctor, and every day my, pa my patients and their families are in the throes of poverty, and every day feels like a struggle. Um, and at some point, there's always a moment that comes up where you, I find myself trying to motivate everyone involved, whether that's the team um, or their parents. Um, and, and I love history and I love studying um, particularly the civil rights and um, everything leading up to that. And um, and I always try finding a way to just like throw in a little empowerment that's also like like how to the people, um, but like on a individual level, um, but also in the setting of every day is a struggle sometimes. And so I just wanted to get your advice on, like, if you guys were in my position and you just have, like, that one little moment to try and, like, empower this family that is just trying to get by, um, what do you say? I, I think one of the first things, sister, is understand 
your children, your children, and try be go into their history, see their family, um, mm -hmm. what the records as a teacher allows you to do, or a doctor allows you to do, so that you can get a perspective of first of all what they're bringing to the class, mm -hmm. the situation, the session that day. <laughs> you don't. Understand that they have to walk there, if they're wearing the same clothes, if they, they are hungry. Understand, first of all, the social analysis. I'll give a social analysis of their, where they are, what they come to. That helps you, number one. You know, you don't know what, if you don't do that, you won't know what's in, who's in your classroom. And then, you know, the the new concept that we're dealing with now is called PSD. It's post traumatic P post -tra PTSD, post traumatic slave slave syndrome. Okay, the thing, the the things that have, we're dealing with from economic housing and then just overall low self esteem because of the situation where white supremacy see, has affected all of us. And so when you can do that first, someone else can help you the rest of the way. But if you do that first, you understand and you see them. You will see them. Any other questions for our panel? Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm uh... Wesley Holland, I would stand up and kind of tall, but I don't want anybody's view of these wonderful people here. I, I was just wondering, I was looking at this young girl right here, and it brought me back to how my dad used to go to the San Francisco State when I was in sixth grade, we'd take him to lectures. And I wonder if we can all commit to bringing our young children to these types of events, rather than, not rather than, but just like we do to other families. How would that play on generations down the line? Yeah. I'm just asking them how that. Hatred is taught. Hatred is modeled on the hatred that we see from our elders, and so is love. So I happen to know this young lady right here. I spoke to her fourth grade class about my dad, Dr. King, and Reverend Abernathy. Um, so I would say that that's an excellent suggestion uh, because this is learned. And the nice thing, it's hard to unlearn something, but it's a lot easier to get it right the first time if you can. But second best is always starting now, right? So, um, you know, we need some re-education, but uh, this lovely couple right here uh, are educating their, uh, their daughter right. And again, it's that multiplier effect that I talked about. Before. And it's not just, you know, in Judaism we see Rabbi Brass could be more eloquent about this than I, but if you kill one person, you're not just killing one person. You've killed every person that that person might have produced in the future. Mm -hmm. But the reverse is also true. If you love one person, if you teach one person right, they're going to pass that on ad infinitum also. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask a follow-up just to, 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 to wrap up for the evening. I'd like to ask Rabbi Sharon Brown's question because I think the point you raised, sir, is such is such such an important one. You know, Michael talked earlier about standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, every single one of our panelists can tell you that the only thing better than standing on the shoulders of a giant is the first time a small person stands up on your shoulders mm -hmm. to prepare to take the fight forward. Sharon, look. This is clearly a very smart young woman. This is not a little girl. But there's kids a lot younger than this who need to hear this message. But for those, for those youngest children, how do we as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as grandparents, how do we talk to the youngest members of our family about these difficult challenges? What advice would you give us and how to prepare them for the effort that we need them to be prepared to join? Well, I think the, the first thing and most important is that we are fundamentally relational beings, that all of us as human beings have a desire to see 
and to be seen by other people. We want to be seen in our beauty. We want to be seen in our suffering. We want to know that our pain matters. We want to know that our stories matter. We want to know that our, our yearnings and aspirations matter. And that's one of the greatest gifts that we can give to each other is to sit and listen to each other's stories and, and give each other the power of our own presence. And as much as each of us needs that, we also have the ability to give it. So I, I just invite us to think about what it means that we're created as relational beings who have the capacity for incredible empathy toward one another and also can be taught, as you said, Abby, incredible hostility toward one another and, and, and to really lean into the empathic side of our hearts. We, um, because, of the, because of the fact of our relationality, because we live best in dialogue, it's, it's both a blessing and potentially a curse. It connects us to each other, but it also often disconnects us from others who we don't th think are like us. But in fact, we're all like us, right? Because every one of us wants to be safe. Every one of us wants to be loved. Every one of us wants to be able to make enough money in our job to be able to feed our kids, and send them to school. Every one of us wants our kids to come home safely. Not every one of us wants to have kids, by the way, but those who do. Right? Uh, and so I, I want to invite us to think about the fact that as human beings, our greatest need is also our greatest gift. Our greatest need is to be affirmed for our own humanity, and our greatest gift is our ability to affirm each other. And that's what children on the playground need, and that's what political prisoners need, and that's what every every one of us has and every one of us needs, and that's the gift that we can give each other. I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of um, the panelists, if you will allow me, to thank you. You have done a beautiful job. <laughs> I will say this, and then we will if we will wrap up. I think you'd all agree that even though we went a little bit long, it was well worth it in order to drink from the wisdom that our, our guests had to share with us. I don't know about all of you, but one of the challenges I face when I leave a program like this one is I leave inspired, I leave excited, but sometimes I leave a little bit overwhelmed. Oh my gosh, there's so much to be done. What can I do? How do I look at this big, broad set of challenges and opportunities, and how do I make a difference? One of the things that I, I try to tell, talk to my students about when we talk about these kinds of seemingly overwhelming challenges is they, like a lot of young people, grow up being told that they can change the world. And as they get older, they realize, you know what, the world is a pretty big place. It's pretty complicated. Changing the world isn't that easy. And I share with them a, a wonderful line I heard years ago from the late Steve Jobs when he delivered a famous commencement speech at Stanford University. And Mr. Jobs talked about the importance of, quote, putting a dent in the universe. Putting a dent in the universe. And what I love about that quote is it reminds us that changing the world is a pretty formidable challenge. Mm. But putting a dent in the universe, that's a much more specific task. So rather than worrying thinking about boiling the ocean and changing the whole world, I'm just going to find one little spot, draw a little bit of an X on the wall, pick up a, pick up, pick up a crowbar, and just put in one small dent. <laughs> and what, of course, happens is if every single one of us puts a dent in the universe, then we do change the world. And I think, I hope, that all of you will join me in thanking our extraordinary panelists tonight. Join me in thanking Gonzalo Abernathy, Avi Dresner, Michael Lawson, every single one of us yeah. in making yeah. this change happen and making it a reality. Before you leave, very quickly, 
Holocaust Museum brings you programs like Building Bridges on a regular basis at no charge. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, we hope you'll go on our website and make a donation. We'll be back here in March for our next Building Bridges program. We hope you'll join us for it. And we kind of thank you so much for joining us tonight and be part of the change.